So we're joined tonight by Philippa. Philippa East is a clinical psychologist and therapist and the best-selling author of three psychological suspense novels, Little White Lies, Safe and Sound, and I'll Never Tell, which I think we've got some excellent covers for there. And I've been lucky enough to read all group. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I'm hoping these are actually for sale in your Etsy shop. Or if you... <laughs> I can, I can make an arrangement. I can make an arrangement. And Philip, there are a few people. This yeah. little bio here, and it's been very, very uh, modest because, of course, you were shortlisted for the dagger for one of them as well, I think. That's right. Yeah, for this one, which was my debut. So, um, yeah, that was shortlisted for the um, New Blood Award with the Crime Writers Association. Fantastic. So, can you tell us a little bit about your writing and your books, please? Absolutely. So, um, so I'm a psychological suspense writer, as you, well, may have guessed from some of the titles and covers and things. You know the genre pretty well, I think. Um, and so, I'll just, I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of each, uh, each book, really, and and um, well, maybe we can go from there. So, as I say, "The Little White Lies" um, is my debut, and it's basically about the White family, um, who's uh, young daughter Abigail has been missing for uh, seven years, but the book actually begins with the miraculous news that Abigail has been found and she's alive and she's now coming home. So um, as, as I'm sure you guys know, as kind of readers of crime and thriller and so on, there's, particularly after Gone Girl, there was a huge spate of books, and there still are in a way, about people going missing, children you know, women, wives, husbands, and all this sort of thing. Um, but I was thinking, what about telling the story of what happens after where these stories normally end, which is often with the, you know, finding the, the missing person. Yeah. And what if the real kind of trauma and and mysteries really surfaced once the there was that reunification? Um, so that's Little White Lies. Um, I absolutely um, loved that book. And, and you could really tell that the psychological angle was was incredible in that one. I loved that one. Oh, thank you. Um, my second one uh, is Safe and Sound. This one is also published with um, HQ HarperCollins. And it was actually inspired by a, um, a real life case Um and it's basically about the, the book is, is about a woman called Sarah Jones, who is known to be um, uh, sociable and charismatic and, um, you know, has a job and all of this kind of thing. Um, but she um, ends up falling behind on her rent. And it's the um, uh, housing manager who's a woman called Jen, who ha sadly has to go around with the bailiffs and knock on the door to chase up this um, unpaid money that's owed. Um, but to the horror, um, when they arrive at the flat, um, well, first of all, they can hear the radio playing. So they mm -hmm. kind of think that she's, you know, she's in there. When they finally get into the flat, they find that there's a table that is uh, set for three. So for, for Sarah and two guests. But they also discover Sarah's body on the sofa. And what quickly becomes apparent as well is that she's been there for um, almost a year. Mm -hmm. And Jen, obviously, is the housing manager, feels incredibly shocked and guilty about this state of affairs, not least because of stuff going on in her own life. She did not do the annual check on this flat that she was supposed to do a few months ago. Um, so Jen takes it upon herself to try and unravel the mystery of how this young woman could have um, died and no one could have realized for such a long time. Uh, so that's uh, Safe and Sound. And then finally, my third book, which is coming out uh, in January, but available to pre-order now. And yes, I do have it on my T-shirt because... I love that <laughs> Because I'm so yes, excited about this book. <laughs> um, and it's uh, it's about um the Goodlight family who seem like a um a really perfect family on the on the um outside. So they live in Woodstock Road in in a you know, very affluent part of Oxford. There's the Julia, the mum, who is a lawyer. There is Paul, her husband, who is a stay-at-home dad. And there's Chrissy, their teenage daughter, who is a prodigious violinist. 
Um, but um, she, so she's taking part in the Young Musician of the Year competition. She's tipped to win. But on the night of the temi, semi, by the televised semi-finals, um, she gives this brilliant performance and then completely vanishes. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't make sense to anybody why she would suddenly, you know, disappear when she's, you know, at the pinnacle of her young career. And uh, her disappearance basically starts to unravel all the truths and um, realities of what's going on within the Good Like household because they are not really perfect after all. I've, so, I've been yeah. privileged enough to have read all three of these books. And what I found with all of them is that, that, that you can tell that you have this background in psychology. I think Karen's put a few comments in the chat as well about how much she loved both of those books that she's been reading. And, but you can really tell how informed they are about how close up you can get to a human being and psychologically analyze them, but within fiction. So can you tell us a bit about your day job and your career as a psychologist as well as being a writer? Yeah. So, so um, yeah, as you mentioned, kind of in the introduction, my day job and my career um, until just a couple of years ago, basically was as a clinical psychologist. So, um, in brief, what a, what a clinical psychologist is, is someone who um, has primarily studied psychology. So initially at um, undergraduate level, like many people have done. Um, and then they, uh, they go, go on to do further specialist training to apply that broad knowledge of human psychology, i.e. just how humans operate, how the brain works, to apply that general knowledge of psychology to the field of mental health. So that's where the clinical bit comes in. So clinical psychology is really um, applying the knowledge of psychology to helping people um, when psychology's gone a bit wrong and we're you know, addressing sort of psychological disorders, mental health illnesses, uh, mental illnesses, that kind of thing. So um, I um, began my clinical psychology training in 2004, and that's really been my, my kind of full-time career until fairly recently. Um, I worked in the NHS for most of that time. Um, I specialized in a few different areas, including uh, eating disorders, um, working with psychosis, and also with trauma, um, which... Um, I think Little White Lies particularly probably draws on the idea yeah. of kind of complicated trauma. Um, and these days I actually work um, uh, in, in private practice. So I have my own therapy clinic um, and, I, and I work part time, which is brilliant because it means that I can actually balance that with, um, with my writing. Um, so so you, you studied psychology at university, I believe, as well. Um, yeah. And you yeah. trained as that. So when did you make this decision to move into fiction writing as well? Yeah, that kind of happened by accident, to be quite honest. So, so um, when, I was, when I was young, you know, I, at school and things, I, I wrote stories and I, I, I liked English. I took English and I enjoyed, you know, creative writing and and reading I've always been a, a massive reader just devour books all the time um but and then like yeah like I say once I started on my kind of um uh study of psychology and training as a clinical psychologist it really just dropped off my radar it never crossed my mind to pursue a career in in writing um I think along the way I always was trying my hand at something creative like whether it was all things I turned out to be quite bad at, like <laughs> photography or drawing or trying to learn ballet and stuff like oh, that. If I it? can interrupt you for one minute, I think there's something you're very good at that's creative that is in Little White Lies at the end. That, uh, no, it's in I'll Never Tell. The, the, you're oh, a violinist. I am. That's true. That is true. So, yeah, I do a bit of music as well. So I suppose that's another... That's another creative outlet that I have going on. Um, but but I still, I never feel very confident as a musician. I don't feel like I'm a natural musician at all, which might sound a bit strange since I do a lot of it these days. But when I tried, when I started kind of creative writing just for fun again when I was about 30. Um, and it was just another little hobby I was trying my hand at, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, all right, a novel, because, you know, you do. Um, yeah. 
and that novel is atrocious. It's not even it's no, nothing like the stuff I write now, and it's I think we've you know all got it's, one of those. It's very world. amateur. <laughs> But I felt like I found my calling. I felt like words, books, stories. I was like, oh, this, this is the thing for me. Um, so then I spent a number of years um, pursuing it kind of s- sort of seriously. And I wanted to learn my craft. I, I you know, was doing sh- many, many short stories and submitting them to magazines and competitions and things. And when I started to getting some of those published, I realized that Maybe I was maybe I was actually all right at this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, and then when I left the NHS and went into private practice and part time, um, that's when I started writing Little White Lies, and that's that's when my writing took off from there. Basically. Could you ever see a, a time when you completely devote yourself to the writing, or will you always stay in? Hmm. Practice? Do you know what? It, yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think about it in two ways. I think about it financially, mm-hmm. and I think about it kind of in time yeah in terms of what I want to be doing in my my sense of my professional identity so the first one is fairly simple at the minute in that financially it wouldn't make sense for me to give up my day job I mean if I was just relying on my writing income it's way too precarious at the yeah. moment to be doing I think that. that would be the same for most people I yeah think the thing that you say you know as all of us I think most people would say is that you don't come out of school thinking my career that I want to pursue is to be a crime fiction writer nobody no. says that well I think I who said does that, that? I mean no. who's I think I said that to a careers teacher who laughed and said you need to get a job to do that <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's still not seen as a job job where you can support yourself really until the, yeah unless you get into you know the higher echelons but what what's interesting i think is how much your 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 background in psychology informs your writing and that overlap between the two i mean reading where the lady is in her flat and you're so up close to this this poor lady who has has died and nobody's been there for her and she's been left there for a year basically but the psychology of the other people's mindset who see this particularly the lady who feels it's her responsibility and those aspects of grief and responsibility I felt throughout all of those books that that you're almost this close to the person and and so do you feel there's a huge overlap between the two? Yeah, definitely. In in so many ways, I think. And just going back to your last question, I think I think even even outside the financials, I don't feel like I'm ready to give up the therapy because it still feels really important to me. And I often think about writing and my career as a psychologist as being like they do inform each other, but also I think they're two sides of the same coin. As in, both of them are my efforts to try and. Uh, make sense of what it means to be a human being um, and to try and think, to try and explore, you know, how do we navigate the world? How do we, how do we overcome difficult things that happen to us? How do we heal? How do we stay healthy? How do we resolve things? How do we come to terms with things? What gets in the way of us being um, kind of stable, happy people really? And I think, I think, yeah, absolutely, Victoria. I think that in my, although they are thrillers, absolutely. And they, you know, I do package up my stories in hopefully a fairly page turning thriller plot. I think what I'm really interested is in the emotional journeys that the characters go on, what they have to confront in themselves or in their lives to, um, to come out okay at the end. And, and, and that's what I'm trying to do, you know, as in my role as a therapist, I'm trying to help people find a path through whatever's happening in their lives. And that's obviously that's what I'm trying to do in my own life, too. You know, I'm not I'm even as I'm a psychologist, I'm not immune to things happening to me. And I'm still always asking myself those questions. You know, how how do I deal with this? How do I cope with this? You know what? Yeah. How, how do how do we survive life? Basically, yeah. I think as I'm trying to figure out. My, and my I think that that your, your books really cope with really talk about that a lot. How do we survive life? How do we survive death and the big things? So. Karen's asked in the chat, um, with your background and understanding of your characters, do you know at the start of the writing who the baddie is? Well, do you huh. have a baddie per se, would you say? Because I find that your your characters are they they overlap in many ways as to whether they're good or bad. 
Yeah, that's a lovely question, Karen. Um, and I think I think maybe there's two elements of the answer there. One, one is the baddie can massively change because I often massively change my plot. So like I often write a version of the story and then kind of junk the whole thing and write something else. And, and usually what's happening is there's a very, you know, I'm getting to grips with what theme I'm really exploring mm -hmm. and to express that theme, often the plot really needs to change. And, and in terms of, you know, who the baddie is, that might really change. So um, the plot, for example, the plot for I'll Never Tell was originally really, really, really different. It was a, the the kind of story behind um, Chrissy, the violinist's disappearance was completely different. And that was taking me in okay. one direction of exploring one kind of storyline, one kind of theme. Um, but actually it wasn't really where I wanted to go with it in the end, or more accurately, it wasn't where my editor wanted me to go with it in the end. Uh, so I kind of ch changed it and that obviously all the, all the plot changed and the characters all kind of changed around and there was a different a cast of, you know, hero, villain and victim in the end. Yeah. Um, but I think the second thing is that, um, yeah, I think, I think none of, I, I never want to make any of my characters necessarily wholly, just psychopathically evil because I don't find that very interesting psychologically yeah. to be quite honest. Um, I'm more interested in people, sort of good people or normal people who do the wrong thing or who mm -hmm. do make a mistake or um, don't deal with something in the way that they should. And then that goes back to the idea of them having to kind of confront that and go above and beyond themselves to to actually do what they need to do. Um, so I think Anne's asking in the chat as well, it, it, it does that kind of evolve as you're writing because I, I you know knowing you a little bit outside of all of this and and as part of the debuts we all talk about our work in progress mm -hmm. and I think yours evolve hugely from the original manuscript yeah definitely I think I, absolutely and I think that um I may not in often I start with the kind of premise which is the sort of hook so obviously for little white lies it was what happens about what happens if you start from when the missing person comes home with um safe and sound it was you know starting with this this situation of a uh, a young woman who should have had plenty of friends and plenty of people around her you know dying with no one realizing and, mm -hmm. and you know what the mystery of that and with i'll never tell it was kind of you know a very atypical situation from someone to disappear from and what again what's what's the story behind that but in answering those questions how i how i end up answering those questions in the in the in the course of the book because as the author i've got to answer that <laughs> that mystery yeah. I, I ask myself yeah. a question and i'm like shit like what's the answer yeah. that yeah. can take a long time to evolve and um the theme can change or sometimes i won't know like with the book that i'm writing now I do actually have a sense of what the theme is, but it's unusual that I've had a sense of it that early on. So yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think for me, like I, the book that I'm writing has to have a theme that really resonates with me. So it has to be something that I'm passionate about understanding and exploring and, and sharing with readers. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, from what I, I know of you, you've obviously you've had three books out since the beginning of, of the lockdown and you're working on your fourth and, I know that you you trash huge sections of your books and, <laughs> and you, you, you know it's just frightening to see how much I hope you're keeping all those bits that get trashed so that's a huge amount of work how do you fit that in alongside I think um Alex is asking in the chat in the chat as well how do you balance your your work and your normal life and your writing life alongside each other um do you know what? It's not actually too bad for me because, well, first of all, um, in my psychology day job now, I just work part time. So I do a maximum of two days a week. Um, so Thursdays and Fridays in my week are my um, clinical days, my psychology days. And I'm very strict with that. So mm. I, I know I don't really have any need for it to spill over those those days. Um, my only other responsibility is my cat. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't have children so that I, I don't I'm not juggling family life i mean i have my spouse but i mean they're pretty self-sufficient so that's fine Hopefully, what hopes by this <laughs> day <laughs> and and so so the rest of my time other than um going back to what we were saying before about the music so my spouse and i were in a um 
an Americana folk duo together uh, called The Miracle Cure. So Which we I do. Love. <laughs> so we we do a fair number of kind of gigs and stuff around you know the the Lincolnshire County and things. We have to rehearse from that and for that and things. But um, but but other than that, it's it's I have the rest of the time is for writing. So I mean. I actually spend a lot of time napping. I, I like, I write, I write, I read, and I nap. And that's pretty much my day to day life. That's superb. So. I mean, I was going to ask you next how do you, uh, how does your knowledge of psychology influence the issues you explore in your novels? But I've seen that Sarah has also asked in the chat, where do you draw your ideas and inspiration from? Which is probably a much greater question but but is it mostly from your psychological work or i mean i suppose we're, we're teetering around the question are there any of your cases that uh, inform your work do you know what that's yeah that's really interesting and the, the the simple answer to that is i don't draw directly on my work to put into my novels because i feel that that would be uh, it would be unprofessional kind of unethical mm. because they're not coming there to give me fodder for my fiction writing. No. Do um, they know you write? Some of them do. I mean, I don't, if they ask or if they come across it on the internet, I wouldn't keep it a secret, but I think, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's an important boundary for me to hold that. I mean, yeah. I, I had a client who came with a, with a situation um, that I was like, this would make such a good novel, but there's no way I would ever write that because I just feel it, it wouldn't be appropriate. And even if that client never, never read it or anything, I just, it, it is, it feels like a misuse of the confidence that they've placed in me to tell me their personal stories. But um, I would say that having, you know, worked as a, as a clinical psychologist or as a therapist for nearly 20 years now, I've obviously come a lot, across a lot of individual stories and those, all those individual stories kind of, come together to show me that there's, there are definitely recurring themes in people's lives yeah. that, and, and from that I can extrapolate to think, well, most of us are going to probably experience these kind of themes, whether it's loss and grief, whether it's some form of trauma, whether it's some form of, um, you know, family dysfunction, whether it's the, the difficulties of parenting a child, you know? So I think that, I'm probably privileged to have a bit of an insight into some really common struggles that we are, we go through as humans. So I don't just have to draw on my own experience to think what matters to people, but I have, you know, the, the privilege of having worked with hundreds of different people telling me their life stories. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, but I think beyond that, I think probably more specific ideas that I might get for books or novels come a lot from true crime. So I watch a lot of True crime Do telly, you? a lot of a lot of podcasts, you know, watching the news. So I think you, you know, you like even with um, you know, the little white lies thing, there was Madeline McCann, you know, is perennially in the news and she was around that time. And I just thought, God, if, if Madeline McCann was found now and she's got those two little siblings, and what the hell? Like, how the hell would she integrate back into her family? And what, mm. and especially with all the suspicion that was cast on her parents at the time, you know, like how would that all go down? Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I think I think real life gives you plenty of fodder. So your expertise in psychology, you presumably you're using for character and for plot at the same time, would you say? Um oh, that's a really interesting question. Um I mean, I mean, for character, definitely. I mean, that's obviously that makes sense, doesn't it? Because you're, you know, you you use yeah. your knowledge of human psychology to make your characters seem like humans, mm -hmm. um, and the kind of kind of difficulties they might have. Um, plot wise, I mean, I suppose plot with plot it comes into, you know, having having the characters behave in ways that make sense. So making sure that they're the actions that unfold in the plot you don't have your characters running around and thinking nobody in that situation would make that decision or whatever. Um, something I do sometimes, <laughs> I was thinking about it, like sometimes um, not so much my um, knowledge as a clinical psychologist or as a therapist, but just from my basic understanding of human psychology. So for example, um, one of the things we have to do in crime and thriller novels is drop clues for the reader but okay. not ones that, uh, that they will pick up on, but not ones that will lodge so well that they'll guess the answer, right? And one of the things we know about how the brain processes in information is if we give them kind of a, a lump of different bits of pieces of information, we tend to remember best 
the bits that come at the very start and the bits that come at the very end. And we're a bit more fuzzy about the bits that are in the middle. Yeah. So um, what I'll often do is if I'm going to drop a little clue, I'll put it in the middle of a paragraph. <laughs> so Brilliant. so it'll that. be there and people will pick it up, but it, it might not lodge quite as consciously as it might have you yeah, I'm, g- I'm gonna take that one it's fabulous because <laughs> yeah. i'm always trying to hide it you know agatha was the, the absolute queen of giving you a bunch of information and in amongst it was the thing that was very very important but because there's so much overload in your brain and you're skimming over that piece sometimes goes astray yeah so- and the other way to do it is because we know that people don't um kind of uh take in information as well if you give them another sort of big piece of information straight after because it kind of you know like you're trying to write a list and then someone says something you're like oh I've just forgotten exactly what I was about to do um and um so sometimes I'll put the clue and then the next sentence put some other big thing that's kind of a distraction so again they've got the clue (laughs) I love that I shift location because personally if I move room and I've gone to get something I will definitely not know what it was I've gone to get yeah again I just shift them slightly in location and if Oh, yeah. furniture's different that's it I'm done yeah that's <laughs> a recognized physical effect as well so all these little tricks it's really good to know <laughs> their brain works <laughs> so I suppose the big question is that how does your background in psychology help you to manage the stresses of being a published author because obviously mm. you more than anybody can see when you're under stress and how to deal with that. And I think, you know, for all of us who are, are, are writers, there are moments when you, you, you're you tearing your hair out, not just with the writing of a book, but the whole issue of becoming an author. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I, I like to feel I have a fairly good handle on it, but maybe, maybe it's because my career is not nosedived. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like maybe I'm still on it. I'm still going all right. <laughs> so maybe ask me that when I'm like on my uppers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think I think some things that help are, are kind of. I mean, I, I work with a lot of clients these days who who may be coming with work stress, and there's lots of specific things we know about the sort of factors that make a job or any any work environment stressful, and what can help with that. So. Um, I, I would say that I probably apply a lot of that for myself as well. So, um, I've, I've done a a few other podcasts or a few other kind of interviews and podcasts about, about this, um, which we can, we can link people to if, if, if they find it helpful, I guess. We'll put them in the chat or we can link it up for other things because whenever you, you speak to, to other authors or, you know, we're on the Facebook group or whatever, and people are really upset or unhappy. It's your voice that I sit <laughs> there and think the voice of reason and sanity has spoken. And, <laughs> and you know, I do think that you you are best placed to set up some sort of psychological treatment and therapy for authors. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there are actually some therapists who do specialise in it because it is do they? niche. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very niche niche job that has a very unique. Uh, stresses on it yeah. so some of the things I talked about in in those podcasts um are you know that that as a career or as a job um publishing is really uncertain and there's a yeah. lot of um unknowns far more than in most jobs you know half yeah. the time we just don't know what the heck is going on even though it's our books our lives our careers and as human beings we don't like the unknown we don't like uncertainty we like to if there's a threat out there we like to know what it is and where it is so we can deal with it and if we're not yeah. that's why we find the darkness often very frightening because we don't know what's in it we can't see anything um so so the the levels of uncertainty in publishing are very difficult so the the counter to that it's anything you can do to get clarity and certainty and information um, is is going to be helpful. And and similar to that, you know, humans don't like to feel helpless. We like to feel that we've got agency in situations. But again, in the in the world of publishing, often we have, or we can feel like we have very little control over what's happening. Yeah. Um, and I think, especially as new authors, often we can we can be passive because we don't 
feel that um, we have a place to speak up or, or ask questions or take the initiative with things. And actually, um, one of the things I've, I've kind of come to realize is actually we just have to be proactive, not in a pushy way or in a, in a, you know, a, a, an annoying way, but um, j- just to take the initiative, just, just to kind of say, you know, is this happening? And if not, well, I, I can set it up myself. That's fine. Or, yeah. you know, to, you know, sign up for, you know, get, get yourself on a podcast if no one's putting you forwards or whatever, and just feel that you are taking charge or you know, there's something that you want to do in terms of your next book or whatever, we'll approach your agent, have a discussion about it. Don't sit back and say, well, no one's asked for my opinion, so I won't, I won't give it. So, I think that is something yeah. that many, many authors that, that we both know together, you know, they're very, there is that fear of, I, I don't like this, but I don't want to upset my publisher. I don't know how to deal with that. And I've always liked your approach to the whole industry of this is your book. This is your career. You need to take control of that. I think we would. If I was a plumber, I would definitely not be, you know, being bossed around by the bloke down the road who had nothing to do with my plumbing or the guy who supplies the water. (laughs) But I think this is a very particular kind of industry. Um, do Do you consider your reader's psychology at the same time as the characters though, and your own psychology, how do those all blend together? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think like psychology applies to everything. So uh, Sarah, you, Sarah Moorhead, you were just saying that your uh, kids just got into study psychology. And I'm just like, the world is this oyster now. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Linda as well was a psychologist. I mean, we're surrounded. Yeah. With, there must be something yeah. in the air with, with crime. Yeah. Writers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think, um, well, I suppose in, in terms of readers, I suppose, you know, it kind of links to what we were saying before about using some little tricks in the writing in terms of how it will land kind of in terms of, information processing in the brain, that kind of thing. I think about it also with, when I'm doing promo, and I suppose this is where things like psychology, you know, are really handy and stuff like advertising and understanding um, what helps people be receptive to the to the things that you're sharing and not just feel kind of pissed off by, you know, oh, yeah. buy my book or whatever, but how to, how to engage people and how to make them feel yeah. like, they, um, you know, have a connection with you as an author. And because that's, you know, that's genuinely what I want. You know, I want to, I do want to feel connected to readers. And obviously as an author, it's slightly strange because we often don't don't meet them or we're not around when they're reading our books. So, you know, how to kind of create that sense of connection with your readers um, yeah. from a distance in a way. And, and you know, I, I like to think about what, what kind of helps with that. And um yeah, so I think I suppose I suppose I'm a bit like a you know a fish in water. I'm probably using psychology all the time, but don't yeah. always realise because it's sort of second nature to me, really. And uh, do you ever find yeah. that it's a hindrance at all that it, in some way you can see the psychology of a situation and think, oh, no, they're doing this, and I'm that I'm not going to be I don't know gaslit by this particular situation, or or, or I'm going to stand up for myself in this particular or, or or you analyze the situation or you in, incorporate it into your book and it doesn't quite go is there any way that your your background may hinder you in any way she's frozen there <laughs> um, well i think uh, oh sorry <laughs> am, am i back am i back, sorry, back i know back. my internet's a little bit glitchy <laughs> um yeah i mean i think uh, Overall, it helps me. I think. I think one of the things I've always been a bit worried about is because my, even my brand, I suppose these days is that you know I'm I'm I, I am a psychologist as well as an author, and that's that's something that I you know I talk about a lot in interviews. It's usually in my author bios and stuff like that, which is which is lovely. I, I don't mind at all, um, but it sometimes feels like a, a pressure because like if I write something, someone's just like. Well, that character is just stupid. <laughs> like, I was uh-huh. supposed to be a psychologist. I was supposed to be able to create like well-rounded characters. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes I feel the pressure. I guess. I suppose we all do, but um, I think that that it's it's. Sorry, I may have gone a bit glitchy again. Oh, no, you're okay. You just we can hear you. Don't worry, we can hear you. Um, I think that perhaps that might be a good place to take a little break as well. 
um because we have a couple of readers to come but that has been okay. i talked to you all night about this and i probably will at some point as well if we ever get to meet in real life um <sighs> I got about a million other questions down here. One that I think, though, that I think everybody will be interested in as a last question is you vaguely mentioned your next book you're working on. How much are we allowed to know about this new project? possible you've frozen there or it's possible you've pretended to freeze so you don't have to tell well, us. well yes um i'm um i'm I... <laughs> okay i think that's you there I think you're on mute. Hang on. Sorry, me... sorry. My internet sorry. is very, very... Ugh. Um, if I heard you right, you were asking about the book that I'm working on just now. That's right. Yes. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit. I, the only reason I'm sometimes a little bit um, hesitant to share about works in progress is um, as they go through the editorial progress, sometimes they completely change. And one yeah. book that I was working on that I told lots of people about ended up completely going in the bin. So that was, that was a bit of a false start. Anyway, so this one, which will be my fourth book, um, uh, is, it's got, I won't go into too much of it, but the key elements of the plot are a remote Scottish boarding school, oh. um, a group of troubled teenagers from the school who are getting up to things they shouldn't be getting up to, um, and um, a very strange story surrounding the school that may or may not be a hoax, um, the death of a therapist um, in very strange and untimely circumstances, and two ex-spouses who have to investigate the whole shebang together. Oh my goodness, I love it already. I'm, I'm busted. You've got to get writing, get writing, get writing. It's I'm on 74,000 words of the draft, the oh first draft, so goodness. it's coming. That is, that's coming. almost there. You're almost there. That's, that's fantastic. That sounds absolutely brilliant. And with the daughter who's just gone to Reading this uh, today, I'm, I'm concerned about the... Uh, the teen angle there, getting up to things they shouldn't be. <laughs> so I think that's been an absolutely fabulous interview, Philippa. Absolutely wonderful. I've learned so much and I've learned a lot more about the books. I'm tempted to go back now and reread them yeah. with this knowledge. But then I know what's going to happen in the end. But then I do reread lots of things like that. I, I'm, yeah, I would heartily recommend them to everybody. And I'm very excited about the new one as well. That sounds absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much, Philippa. Oh, thank you, Victoria. And thank you, everyone. It's been a real pleasure for me to chat away about this stuff. I could chat Definitely. about it for hours. So thank you for listening. <laughs>
established a justice and peace youth group and written articles for newspapers and magazines about her work in education and religion. My goodness, I don't know how you found time to write a book amongst all (laughs) that as well. But I've read Mm. Witness X and it is a book that just stays with you. It is one of those books. And Oh, lovely. I know Thank it is you. Good for many, many people as well. Um, so I think you're going to be reading to us from, I presume, a really gory bit. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I've, to give a I've just changed. <laughs> I was going to do a gory bit, but I've just changed my mind. But um, just to introduce the book. So the book is, um, it's about a neuropsychologist who develops a technology to experience people's memories for herself. So she, while she's trying to solve a crime um, that her sister was involved with, she uh, kind of literally sort of sees and hears and feels what people feel when they witness the crime, or even maybe she can go into the mind of the murderer. And at this point, there's a nurse called Isabel, and she's been taken by the killer. Uh, and she's been kept in a mortuary fridge. And the reason, um, part of the reason I wrote this story was because I wanted to examine the mind of a killer and what they might be going through, as well as looking at the victims. So this is from Isabel's perspective. Time doesn't exist in the silence of the mortuary fridge. She has no idea how long she's laying there, accompanied by only her own terrified thoughts, which collide to scope around her in the sensory deprivation. Worse than the darkness and the unknowing is the utter torment of listening, making every second endless, straining to hear any movement outside her metal sarcophagus to tell if her captor is returning. Finally, the light comes again. He pulls out the tray. His hands are sheathed in blue gloves like the ones she wears in the hospital. She feels like a rare butterfly pinned in a museum drawer. His face is hidden behind a plastic mask. She wonders if that's a good sign. Maybe it means he doesn't want to uh, doesn't want her to be able to identify him. Maybe that means he won't kill her. After her cleansing the last time, she's incredibly thirsty. Her tongue is dry, her mouth sticky and bitter. He unbuckles the straps around her legs and waist and sits her up. He holds a bottle in front of her. It looks like water and hands it to her. She pauses momentarily. What if he's put more drugs or even poison in it? But she's so parched, she gulps the water down until it is all gone. He takes a bottle from her grasp and puts a plastic food tray in front of her, the type a child might use, with bright pictures of zoo animals hiding beneath the food. Chicken nuggets, baked beans, apple slices, a tube of yoghurt and a cartoon with a cartoon character strawberry on the front. She's hesitant at first, and then over the overwhelming smell, the growling of her stomach. When was the last time she ate? It overwhelms her, and she shovels the food into her mouth with her hands. From less than a metre away, he stands watching, motionless, his mismatched blue eyes unblinking behind the mask. You always love chicken bites, he says. She stops halfway through a mouthful, regards him, and then begins chewing again slowly. I miss you, Elise. Why is his voice trembling? Why is he calling her Elise? She knows he's staring, but she focuses on the food. If he is feeding her, then he might want her to live. When she finishes, he takes away the tray and turns to place it to one side. She wipes her hands on the white shroud and the tomato sauce from the beans smears across the cotton like blood seeping through a bandage. He turns back holding a muslin cloth and sees what she's done. His eyes narrow and she grows afraid again. Look what you did, Elise, he hisses. He'll beat you for that. He will. If he sees you, you'll be in for it. He becomes distressed, wringing the muslin cloth between his hands. What will we do? What will we do? He cries, his arms, his alarm inflaming her own fears. What the hell is he talking about? She feels her heart kick into overdrive. The food feels like concrete in her stomach. He'll be back soon, he whispers. Then we're in for it. His odd eyes widen behind the plastic. Is he afraid? Let me think, let me think. He straps her arms back down, then ties the muslin cloth around her arm like a tourniquet. He turns around to a metal tray behind him and brings back a syringe. 
A globule of liquid drips from the tip before he jabs it into her, her arm. When the barrel's empty, he takes it out again. He turns away briefly, and when he faces her, he holds the scalpel. The drug immobilises her almost immediately. What has he given her? She tries to think of the medications that she's learned about in the hospital, but she can't concentrate. She stares helplessly at the sharp metal blade. He moves closer to her, pointing the scalpel at her chest, then her belly, then up to her neck. Isabel thinks she's screaming, but there's no sound at all except the high-pitched sipping sound as the scalpel slits her garments from the neck to the hem. He cuts down the arms and somehow pulls the cloth from underneath her, leaving her naked, exposed. But he averts his eyes, not even looking at her face. Then he leaves her alone, shutting the door behind him. Her body feels a heavy prison for her petrified mind. The room is cold, and without any covering, she feels the temperature drop. Is she shaking? In her peripheral vision to her left, she recognises the metal tray, like the ones in surgery, the flat grey lines of terrifying steel instruments laid out in preparation. The drug doesn't take the edge off her fear of what they could do to her body. She listens to the gurgling in her stomach as the water and food digest, wondering why he's fed her if he's going to kill her, trying to read into every little thing he says or does to make sense of what is happening, what might happen to her. In front of her, near the door, there's an ancient rusted red generator chugging away. Cobwebs hang from the ceiling above her. To her right, high up, a frosted glass window lets in a dull light. Is it a garage or an outhouse? Her fingers twitch with minuscule movements. Her eyeballs flick back to the instruments, the agony of being able to see them, but not to reach. He is in total control. She is going to die. <laughs> and from one fantastic reading to another, we have Karen next, who uh, has written a fabulous book called The Storytellers, which I've been very privileged to have received a copy of to read, which is beautifully written. Um, and chatting to Karen just now, I've learned a lot about her as well, that um, she has just retired from being a headmistress, so no naughty in here, um, <laughs> and has, a, well, not recently married, but recently in terms of, you know, the span of my vast existence. <laughs> Um, and is trying to find a new house as well. <laughs> what I love more than anything that, that Karen has in her biog is this fantastic quote of, now she's really worried what I'm going to say, aren't you? <laughs> she has three childhood dreams in her life. Oh, yeah. Become a published author, done. To become a teacher, well, you did that and extra headmistress, and for David Essex to fall in love with her, silver dream <laughs> racer himself. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time. I mean, you've only just well, you married well, five years ago. You haven't told us who you married. That was it, David Essex. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> but he did. Um, I did tweet that. And he did reply to me. There's, 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 there's hope yet. And he said two out of three ain't bad, Karen. Oh, <laughs> you're in. So there. that's a no. <laughs> and this his loss, from... Karen. It's his loss. Uh, <laughs> and this from a lady who I don't know what section of your book you've chosen to read. All equally fabulous, but also just as affecting as as sarah's book with with some and and it's it's difficult to meet people in real life sometimes because you think this lovely lady who likes david essex has written this book <laughs> that's that's an i don't think we need trigger warnings on here but there we are <laughs> <laughs> take it away karen well i'm just my book is the storytellers um and i'm probably holding up the wrong way but well, it's a storytellers, and it's about three women, uh, three very different women that meet um, in the sort of limbo between life and the afterlife. And they're forced to revisit their toxic relationships with men. Um, and they must, before time runs out, they have to answer the question, what is love? 
So I'm just going to start with chapter one. That's a very good place to start. <laughs> and this is Ronnie, Liverpool. Singles night. When conjoined, there can't be two more desperate words unless they're speed and dating. It's busy. Plenty of people dressed up in their peacock finery, searching for connections. Hip hop tunes blare through mists of discomfort. How will the lonely voices converse tonight? I'll need a few drinks to get through this. At least they've only got 10 minutes each. I sip my pina colada and glance over at Mr. Nobody number one. The bar is sophisticated, dark, and just the right side of expensive. His Primark sweater in bright purple is not. I promised myself an end to this. I never learn. Another sip of my drink and Mr Nobody edges his chair just that little bit closer. His breath reeks of beer. You better watch out. I bite. He tells me how frustrated he is. He's always horny, but he can't get it up. His girlfriend left him. She cheated. It affected his confidence. I call him on his bullshit. At 40, I've heard every line. As he bumbles an apology, I'm already thinking of chicken fried rice and getting home in time for casually. Slouching back in my seat, I take a deep breath in preparation for Mr Nobody number two. His long knotted beard is speckled with dregs of the salted nuts he's piling into his mouth. And as he talks, specks of brittle and half-eaten shells spurt out. They scatter around us. I try to be polite. Sincerely, I do. I pluck a pink umbrella from my drink and drain the glass. As he drones on and on about his model train collection and intricate detail, I crack and crunch ice with my teeth. Then he produces a small gold case and retrieves a toothpick from it. It's sad, but I'm out. You'd think as you get older, it'd be easier to find the one, but it's not. All the dregs are left, the dumped, the unwanted, men who have been deemed unworthy by the rest of womankind. They should wear warnings slapped across their head. Cheater, liar, married, Peter Pan. A buzzer rings behind me, and a woman sheathed in pink shrills. Time's up, move on. But that's a problem. I've been moving on so very long. Drinks are lifted, chairs pushed back. A man to the left of me doddles. Drains the last from a whiskey tumbler and looks to his left and right. Escaping towards the light of a knee and exit, my heel catches in sticky carpet. And as if in slow motion, I begin to topple until a stranger engulfs me into his arms and breaks my fall. I gasp and shrug him off, but he pulls me into a dark white corner and pushes me firmly against a wall. He's wearing tight black jeans and a cream polo, taller than me, broad-shouldered, his eyes emerald green. How have I not seen him before? He's gorgeous. He sweeps my hair over my back and traces a finger down my neckline. Tendrils of vanilla scent drift towards me, potent, compelling. I want to taste him. Beautiful pearls, he whispers. My breathing goes faster and a flush warms my skin. He smiles, leans in, and brushes his lips against mine. I've no idea why I'm allowing this to happen. Perhaps, it, perhaps it's a drink and the muddle train engines. His grip on my hair tightens and his breath grazes my skin. Tell me you want it, he says. I do, I really do, but not like this. I'm nobody's bitch.